Lollipop Chainsaw is a bootleg Bayonetta simulator developed by Grasshopper Manufacturer and released in 2012 for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. The game was the product of a collaborative effort between Suda51, best known for some other crazy games like Killer7 and No More Heroes, and James Gunn, a Hollywood filmmaker who is most recently known for directing Guardians of the Galaxy. But for this game, his most relevant works would have been his role as writer for Zack Schneider's 2004 adaptation of Dawn of the Dead, and his superhero comedy, Super. Given the content and themes for Lollipop Chainsaw, that being a comedic zombie kill fest set in a California high school, James Gunn was a good fit for his role writing the story and characters. And Suda51 is, uh, well... Suda51's games are definitely more style than substance. By that I mean his games usually just barely meet the necessary criteria in gameplay to be playable. Play any game of his and you'll notice that right away. It's pretty important you know what to expect before playing any game, but you shouldn't let a lack of quality gameplay deter you from having what could be an entertaining time. You may not wholly understand what I mean by that, but I'll circle back to that at the end of the video, and maybe this rundown of the game and opening will help enlighten things for you. You play as Juliet Starling, a bubbly, ditzy, and barely legal high school cheerleader of San Romero High. She's a big fan of lollipops and being told she's not fat. After high school, she works with her family as a super sparkly, rainbow chainsaw-wielding zombie hunter. The game opens with Juliet waking up on her 18th birthday and rushing to meet up with her boyfriend, Nick, whose hobbies include bass guitar and masturbation. However, before she can meet him, she runs into an outbreak of zombies and has to slice her way through them to get to Nick. Juliet arrives just a tad too late, and Nick ends up getting bit by one of the zombies. So in order to save him from becoming a zombie himself, Juliet cuts off his head, casts a spell to keep him alive, and carries him around on a strap latch to her hip. You know, basic high school stuff. After chopping and shopping their way through the school, Juliet and Nick, uh, bump into Juliet's promiscuous sensei. They team up to find the cause of the zombie outbreak, which just so happens to be the edgy, misanthropic emo kid taking out his revenge on all the cool kids for bullying him. So it's all up to Juliet and her wacky family to stop Captain Grimdark and his dark purveyors that were summoned as part of the ritual to destroy the world. It's a very simple story that mashes two incredibly tired and played out genres, but remains wonderfully creative and inventive thanks to the ludicrous and comedic direction the game takes. All the zombies in the game take on a sort of Evil Dead personality, very crass, foul-mouthed, and snarky. One of the few zombie tropes that I actually find to be underutilized and quite charming. The gameplay itself sort of resembles that of most character action games. You've got two different chainsaw swings for high and low, a pom-pom bash to stun enemies, and a jump which can also function as a dodge. And of course you can chain button combos to perform different moves like a corkscrew attack or a windmill swing. Control feels quite stiff. Basic swing attacks take just a hair too long to complete, and there's an odd cooldown animation if you try to pom-pom bash consecutively too much that you can't cancel out of and doesn't apply to any other attack for some reason. At the beginning of the game you have almost no expanded moveset or combos, it's just basic attacks. All of the combos have to be bought at the Chop and Shop, using the zombie medals that fly out of your enemies if you defeat them in a flashy enough manner, complete a secondary objective, or just pick them up off the ground. Since the game can't anticipate you having any sort of range of moves, all the enemies have to be designed to be killed with just your basic attacks in mind. This tends to make all the enemies feel quite similar, apart from like the bigger ones which just need to be hacked up a bit more. So there may be a change in how they look, but how they act is more or less the same. The real tragedy is that the combos you can buy don't really affect how you approach certain enemies or encourage you to try different tactics. You can just spam the same three button attack ad nauseum until everything in front of you is dead. Er, dead, er, huh. There's not a whole lot of variation in attack types, just different button combinations to achieve more or less the same result. If all that wasn't bad enough, you can't actually see what you're buying before you even get it. All you're given is a short description of what it is, and it's vague at best. So you have no way of knowing what it actually does, how large of an area it covers, how it affects enemies, or how difficult it is to pull off, because you're only told what the button combo is after you've bought it. That's just bonkers! So do yourself a favor. Buy the armadillo spin, then XX square your way to victory. It's cheap, easy to perform, and very powerful. The higher difficulties are mostly just your basic number tweaks. You carry fewer lollipops, enemies deal more damage, and have more health. It's pretty standard stuff, but scales up the challenge an appreciable amount, and they even throw in some more special enemies along with a few extra collectibles to boot. While you're killing zombies, a little star meter will fill up in the lower left corner. 
Once this maxes out, you can enter Hyper Mode, where every swing is an instant kill on every enemy except for bosses. It's a useful technique for clearing large groups of zombies quickly and for sparkle hunting. Sparkle hunting is when you kill three or more zombies in one swing. A short slow-mo animation will play and you'll gain some bonus zombie medals and platinum medals. The zombie medals are used for buying character upgrades like health and strength and also for buying more moves. The platinum medals are used for buying different outfits, soundtracks, and concept art. So the platinum medals are used to buy superficial things, but they count towards your final score, so it's a good idea to sparkle hunt as much as you can. Which is a neat thing to see happen the first few times, but after the 50th, it does tend to get a bit annoying. Yep, yeah, alright, yep, yep, yeah, uh, yes, alright, yep, yep, alright, they're dead, come on out, alright, yep, mm -hmm. okay, yep, yep, no, yep, they're dead too, okay, yep, mm -hmm. alright, mm -hmm. yep. After you beat the game, you can use some of those platinum medals to buy some outfits of characters from anime like High School of the Dead, Dead Man Wonderland, and uh, this one, which of course I've never seen before in my life. <laughs> Alright, let's get back on track. Over the course of the game, you'll receive phone calls from your family, and the first time you get one, it plays a short cutscene of Juliet taking, then listening to the call. But some future phone calls can't actually be answered, and are instead only accessible by then pausing the game and navigating through Juliet's stash to find them listed in non-consecutive order for some reason. But others are given the cutscene treatment for no discernible reason. All the phone calls are either pointless chatter or mini-tips and don't actually serve much purpose anyway, so what's the point? Well, this is a running theme. Throughout the levels, you'll run into some classmates that need saving. Killing all the zombies around them will not use some extra coin, and you'd think that these might be some sort of secondary objective for the levels, but, uh, no. They don't affect your score, and they don't unlock any extra upgrades. They're just something to distract you for a little bit. The game also seems to forget about them after the first level. Level 1 has the most, with 8 classmates to rescue. Level 2 has 4. Level 3 has just 1. Level 4 has 3. And level 5 has 2. Bear in mind, all these stages are about the same size and length, but have so few classmates that whenever you actually run into one, it'll catch you off guard because you will have forgotten that they were even a part of the game. Now, I'm not complaining that they weren't used enough. On the contrary, I think that they were actually used too much in the first level. It set a precedent that made you think that they were a bigger deal than they are, but in reality, they're incredibly sparse later on and have almost no impact on the rest of the game, except that you have to rescue them all in order to get the good ending. But, on the other hand, there's just not enough in each level to really incentivize you to go through them again to rescue the one or two that you missed. Really, the only reason to replay a level is to find named zombie bios and lollipop wrappers on higher difficulties. And you want to know the best thing about those two collectibles? If you guess that they're completely pointless and only reward you with ascending numbers and literal flavor text in your pause menu, then you'd be right! That theme I mentioned about things being pointless? There's no reason to collect anything in Lollipop Chainsaw, except for maybe to get an achievement. The only collectible worth a damn are the zombie medals, and you get those just by playing the game normally. It's like all the collectibles were put in because that's what people would expect from a game like this, but the designers neglected to give them any real purpose or value. The video game equivalent of jingling some shiny things in front of your face and hoping you get excited by them. Which, at last, brings us to the game's disappointing rating system. You're only given a score at the end of a level, and the only thing you're graded on is how many medals you got, how many times you performed sparkle hunting, and how long it took you to complete the level. So you can take tons of damage and then burn through health items like there's no tomorrow without affecting your score at all. At the very least, it makes me more accepting of all the QTEs, since there's never really much penalty for failing the ones that result in you taking damage for failing. And it also does provide some minor incentive for rescuing students, since they do reward you with the medals. But that's about it. Normally, trying not to take damage or use health items is part of the fun of character action games. It gets you familiar with the controls, moves, and enemies so that you can get a deeper sense of appreciation for how tight and consistent all the elements are and how they work together and whatnot. So, of course, this isn't the case here. The designers just want to get you from the beginning of the game to the end, so they slap together popular elements of other action games and put up the veneer that this is somehow similar. Now, as insidious as I made that sound, it's really not that big of a deal once you learn you can ignore these elements and just enjoy the game for everything else that it brings to the table. You'll recall that I mentioned that Suda51's games have a habit of being just barely playable, and hopefully now you see what I mean. The depth in the gameplay department is almost non-existent, and if you play games for that sole reason, give this one a pass. But through the footage you've seen, you've also probably noticed what I mean when I say style over substance. The game is just oozing that kitschy comic book vibe in every inch of the screen. A persistent polka dot pattern filter over the screen at all times to give it that budget comic book feel, hand-drawn menu icons, and even a handful of licensed music tracks ripped straight out of the time period. I mean, you can see for yourself, there's a whole lot of love put into there. Not to mention the whole game is like something that some horny teenager who's into zombie flicks and 80s nostalgia would come up with. Which is probably not far from the truth. 
I'm on to you, James. You know, it's just dumb, flashy, skimpy, bloody violence tied together with the most bland generic story and topped with a heavy peppering of sophomore quips and observations. What's not to love? Seriously. The game might not be a total blast to play all the time, but it's a unique experience in a game filled with creative and inventive set pieces and scenarios that you're just not gonna get anywhere else. Turn your brain off and just enjoy the cheesy, whimsical ride. It's okay to enjoy something for the sheer dumb spectacle of it every once in a while. The writing is consistently on point, cracking wise with every other line, and never wearing out its welcome. What's your favorite color, Nick? Blue? No, green. Awesome! I love learning about you. I fucked up, it's yellow. Genuinely funny dialogue and scenarios without seeming like it's trying too hard. For the first couple levels. Uh, the comedy tends to fall short after meeting your younger sister in the third level. After that, the humor is kind of sporadic. There are still some gems here and there, but the overall quality kind of decreases over time. I mean, I get that your younger sister is supposed to be loud and annoying and you're not supposed to like her that much, but man, is it hard to like anything that goes on whenever she's involved. A lot of the humor comes from Juliet playing funny man, while Nick has to play straight man, so if you're not a big fan of that dynamic, you may not be all that impressed with the jokes. Killing zombies gives me total wood. That's a weird thing to say. None of the humor is particularly highbrow or even tasteful, but it matches that juvenile brand to blend well with the style of the game. I can't help but chuckle when reading some of these zombie bios. Each stage has its own genre of music to fit the upcoming boss, and really puts you in the mood for each new encounter. Even before you officially meet a boss, you already know a bit about them just by listening to the stage music, which I think is really cool. Admittedly, a lot of games do this. An ice-themed boss will be in the snow world with some wintry-themed music. But here you've got themes like punk, viking metal, psychedelic, funk, and rock, which is a fresh yet familiar take, and again, fits the game world very well, even if the visual set pieces don't always line up. All of the boss themes were written by Little Jimmy Urin of Mindless Self-Indulgence fame. He even provides the voice of the first boss, Zed, which is a great fit, by the way, because the guy's got a real set of pipes. And yes, the achievement for defeating him is exactly what you expect. I think his compositions are great, but even if that ain't your cup of tea, let me show you this list of other songs and artists that are strewn throughout the game. Yeah, it's no surprise that the soundtrack is one of the highlights of the game. Songs that fit the theme, periods, stages, and are all just fun to listen to overall. It's a knockout selection, plain and simple. But now we've reached the part of the review where I'm going to have to start spoiling a lot of the more unique set pieces and events, after which I'll cruise right into the end game story stuff, so if you have any mind to play the game, now's the time to either stop or just skip ahead to this time code for the conclusions. And there may be even some spoilery stuff there though, so be warned. All good? Uh, right then, moving on. A lot of games will do something like this. You're pulled out of the core gameplay and shoehorned into a forced scenario where all the controls change and you have to fulfill some random objective or minigame. You know the type, it's usually pretty unpleasant. You play a game for the core gameplay, so when you suddenly gotta do something that's not that, it feels more like a chore that you just wanna get over with so you can get back to the game. And it can be even way worse when it ends up being like one of the harder parts of the game. In Lollipop Chainsaw, because the core gameplay is just kinda underwhelming and the scoring system is so lax, these events can actually be the highlights of the game. You'll be looking forward to the next wacky situation that you'll be pulled into next. Whether it's zombie basketball, chainsaw boosting across the rooftops, driving a combine through hordes of zombies while Dead or Alive plays in the background. When you're being pulled into cabinets in the arcade level, you've got your Pac-Man segment, but did you ever imagine you'd end up making your way through a friggin' Hotel Mario stage? You can never tell what's gonna happen next, so you actually end up slogging through the normal game bits and looking forward to the next wacky situation bits. That's the second half of where the charm of Lollipop Chainsaw comes from. Just the stuff you do. It's unrestrained from a story or set that has to take itself seriously, so it cuts the middleman from things happening from your character to things happening to you. The characters hardly care about what's happening. They only care about making jokes, but you're along for the ride and the game takes advantage of that by constantly throwing curveballs. Does that mean that everything that it does is great? Of course not. I could do without some of the stuff that they shoehorn in there, but there were always destined to be a few rotten eggs in the mix. And honestly, I think they didn't get quite crazy enough. Why not just go full ham anime and make Juliet's chainsaw grow to the size of a skyscraper to kill a boss or something? As it is, it's actually fairly tame in terms of how wacky things get, but I still enjoy what there is regardless. I may prefer things being cranked up to 10 points past the max, but there's still merit when you have some actual ground to stand on. But now that I've appeared to have exhausted that train of thought, let's talk bosses. The five main bosses are introduced and promptly killed off before and after each of their fights, each of them an overemphasized stereotype of some kind of 80s or 90s culture, so you could basically just classify them as super mooks. 
And while each charming in their own way, I feel that only the first had any actual personality that made him stand out above the others. The fights themselves aren't anything to write home about either. They lack much of any difficulty or problem solving. Their multi-phase design feel like a string of underwhelming mini-bosses, and cumulatively, they don't often amount to much. I love the fights with Zed and Lewis Legend because they have some wacky inventive attacks and great music. Zed felt like he had real personality, and Lewis had an actually interesting fight that just wouldn't stop. On the other hand, the other three bosses lack any real appeal beyond their visual design and have fairly boring fights associated with them. An unfortunate consequence of the half-baked combat mechanics. But even they are nothing compared to the final boss who for some reason is another Elvis impersonating zombie directly after your fight with an Elvis impersonating zombie, not to mention your dad has already been like channeling the king since the moment you met him, and there are rockabilly themed normal enemies that you've been fighting for the whole entire game. But even if you ignore that, Killabilly is simply one of the most insulting and disappointing final bosses I have ever fought. First off, let's set the stage for what happens right before the fight. You defeated the fifth and final Dark Purveyor, and Swan, the main antagonist, laughs at you with the whole <laughs> This was all a part of my plan from the beginning, spiel, before sacrificing himself to open a portal to the Rotten Realm so that all the zombies can flood the place and destroy the world, right? It's the entire plot of the game. But that's not what happens at all. It's just this one big, dumb, fat zombie that stands between you and the credits. The run up to him is fine, chainsaw dashing through the streets while Dragon Force jams you on is just cool as hell, but the fight itself lacks any real spectacle that you would hope from a final encounter like this, and just thrusts the most bland, generic, large enemy tropes that there are. Hack at his hands, dodge his hugely telegraphed attacks, shoot at his eyes, win. Then your dad blows a hole in his face for you to jump into, and just when you think that there might actually be a fight waiting for you inside of him, your spirit finally breaks when the only thing that you have to do is walk through an empty hallway, cut some weird tentacle spikes before a QTE takes you to the end of the game. And alright, I admit it, it's kind of funny seeing him jamming out there in the background. But apart from that, he has almost zero redeeming qualities about him. It's one of those tropes that I see in a lot of Japanese games that I almost universally hate. Some random large monstrosity pulled out of literally nowhere at the last second and is suddenly billed as the main antagonist for no reason. Its sheer banality dampens what had been a mostly original experience thus far and closes the game on a disappointingly low note that not even the final cutscenes can rectify. Nick has to sacrifice himself to destroy the monstrosity, but is immediately revived before anyone can even react to him being gone. Even though the story and the characters are meant to be stupid, I do think that there could have been a little more going on in the story, and pretty much everyone in Juliet's family was undercooked. Her older sister barely appears at all, her younger sister I mentioned was loud and annoying, her dad is just your average protective father with a Johnny Bravo complex, and her mom is your typical ditzy mom figure who never actually even shows up in the game. The Starling family just bring very little to the table, other than an excuse to give Juliet some new upgrades in the form of birthday presents and cause some light conflict. Juliet and Nick would have had a good enough dynamic on their own to carry the game, but even that gets shattered towards the end. There's a part of the game where Nick is just fed up with all the crazy things that are happening and wants to ditch. An event which Juliet starts stressing and worrying about at the very beginning of the game. I hope Nick isn't mad. That's about the worst thing that could ever happen! But it turns out Juliet isn't phased in the least about Nick being mad. She just tells him no, and oppresses him with her cheery attitude until he gives up on complaining about it. No, it's really hard being a downer around you sometimes. It's like you bum out my bummer and transform into something good, and I hate it! You're adorable. Like I said, the story is meant to be dumb and doesn't take itself seriously, but when they have opportunities to add any real depth or personality to the characters using foreshadowed drama, they sacrifice it for yet another lame one-liner or juxtaposed triviality. And I don't think it would have cramped the vibe of the game, it could have added a modicum of real drama to the characters to make you care about them just a little bit for the ending to have any real stakes. Like if Juliet let Nick go, then the villain kidnaps him and uses him as a head of some Frankenstein zombie that Juliet has to defeat, and then after the fight, Juliet and Nick both realize the mistakes that they made and then team up once again to take down the final boss. It could have even added greater impact for Nick to sacrifice himself to destroy the big bad because he and Juliet would have just realized how much they truly loved each other, and now they had to part ways forever. It's not particularly great writing, but the elements are all there and it could have made the story a little more engaging than what we got. Lollipop Chainsaw is a real roller coaster of quality, high points and low points, and is in general a fairly subpar product. Despite becoming Suda51's highest selling game at the time, it's probably one of his weakest. I still enjoy and tentatively recommend it though, because it does have glimmering qualities that are worth experiencing and sharing. 
It's not a carefully curated game with deep intuitive gameplay, but because it's a game, things that it does have an extra impact that you can't get from any other medium. The first boss of the game, Zed, is a punk rock zombie who shouts swear words and calls you names in all caps giant letters that fly out and literally hurt you if you don't dodge them. The gameplay itself isn't deep, but how can you help but grin like an idiot in that moment? It's what inspired me to make this video in the first place. You could probably recreate a scene like that in a movie or TV show, but it's all the more impactful that it's happening directly to you in the form of a game. Games don't necessarily have to have a good story, character, or gameplay to be enjoyable. Suda51 and his team proved this with his overwhelming sense of style, inspired art and sound direction, and using the medium for unique experiences. Could it be better with more refined mechanics and a thoughtful story? Definitely. But the point I'm trying to make is that following the mindset that touts gameplay and story as the end-all, be-all, most valuable aspects of a game sells short the raw potential of games as a medium. Lots of people like a good story to go along with their games, or enticing and responsive gameplay experience with high replayability. I'm one of them. These things are important, and people often weigh their value differently but often at the expense of considering what exactly a game can be capable of when it comes to delivering a certain experience that can't be achieved through any other medium. Why do you think people enjoy those fourth wall breaking moments in movies so much? Because for the briefest of moments, that character on screen is suddenly talking to you now. It's a little weird and jarring, but it feels more personal and gets your attention and, contradictorily, pulls you further into the movie. Games can do this too, but in much more subtle ways. Interactivity impacts everything you feel from entertainment. By ditching the story and setting his games in wacky wonderlands of hilarity and mysticism, Suda51 sets it all up so that the things that happen to you are memorable and distinct, not just the character you're playing as. These kinds of things are often quite bland and unoriginal in most games, stuff like magic or monsters, things you see in movies and books all the time, so putting them in a game for you to experience firsthand doesn't have the proper impact because they're so standard. You could play a different zombie game where you have to conserve ammo and search for a cure while slogging through this melodrama of death and humanity, or you could play one where you have to shove your boyfriend's head on a decapitated zombie and cheer him on while he walks over to blow up an obstacle. Of course, I'm not saying that all other games that take a more serious or realistic approach are bad or aren't capable of that kind of interplay. A lot of them can. But what about a story like this makes it worth telling through the medium of a game? And what does it really present that can be explored through gameplay? Lollipop's story is simple and dumb, but it opens up a host of possibilities for what can be done in the context of interactivity, and it constantly subverts what you might expect could happen, and that's what makes it valuable. Does it take full use of this setup and execute it successfully? Well, more often than not, no, but it does serve as a bit of a vacuum piece to highlight the moments when it does. Good gameplay and story compound off of this most basic element of the game, and it's surprising to see how often it goes ignored. Without it, games can still be enjoyable, but they lack a bit of soul. I'm not saying that it's the end-all, be-all, most important thing itself. I would never call Lollipop Chainsaw a masterpiece, because it is severely lacking in other departments. I think I've made that clear by now. But it shows off how impactful it can be by bringing it to the fore. That's part of the reason why I recommend you play games before you watch my review of them. Even if you feel put off because the gameplay or story aren't exactly all that, there's just this charm that can't be fully expressed visually or through words. You gotta play it. You gotta feel it. Not all games need to have it. Not all games can do it well, but Lollipop Chainsaw, as crude, juvenile, and rough around the edges as it is, undoubtedly does. Oh yeah, and by the way, that record from the beginning of the video wasn't really the Cordettes, it was actually ABBA. Sorry about that.